Hi, welcome to the module two video on ancient Egypt. If you're watching this now, that means that you have already done the readings, both that in the Laurie Schneider Adams text, but also the reading about the tomb of King Tutankhamun that I posted on Blackboard as well. I want to stress the importance of these readings. They are valuable information. They give you much more than I can offer you in an hour-long lecture. They offer a much better sense of chronology than I can offer as well, uh, and they will also be included in the materials that you're tested over, so I highly encourage you to do the readings. This is very, very important. Uh, and don't forget that immediately after watching this video, you should follow the link to the self-assessment. The self-assessment, again, is not uh, counted towards your grade, it's graded so that I can see how you're doing, how well you're absorbing the material, what I can do better uh, to make sure you're understanding. And this is going to happen after every single video, so please be sure to do the self-assessment immediately following watching here. So I wanted to talk a little bit about what we'll be covering in today's lecture. This is going to be a very quick overview of several thousand years of history, so it's important to try to keep a sense of that, that we're covering a lot of time in a very brief lecture. I'll talk a bit about the geography of ancient Egypt. That is very important with any lecture we do. It's a, it, you must know where we're talking about for all of these things. This will also serve as an introduction of Egyptian culture. Remember that in art history, we cannot talk about the art without knowing about the history. One thing you'll notice about ancient Egypt is there's this strong focus on funerary practices. That is, preparation for the afterlife, um, objects for use in the afterlife, monuments where kings especially were buried. These are some of the best surviving examples of art we have from ancient Egypt, so you'll hear a lot about that today. Going hand in hand with that is this focus on religion in ancient Egypt because the funerary practices are directly tied to their associations with the gods. So we'll learn a little bit about this very complex religion. Again, your book will give you much more information on that than I can. So let's start with this map to make sure you know exactly where we're talking about today. Here we see a general map of Europe, the Middle East, and Northern Africa. Egypt can be down, found down at the bottom right of this map, as you can see here. And now I'll switch and show you a detail of ancient Egypt itself. Today we'll be talking about a number of different centers. We have monuments at Giza, uh, up in the northern part, underneath the large text that says Lower Egypt. Also, we'll be looking at a monument from Saqqara. Going a little further south, you see the city called Akhetaten, also in parentheses Tel El Amarna. We'll be looking at monuments from there. And further down below, there are other important centers, including Thebes, Karnak, and Luxor. This is the area with some major temples. Unfortunately, we're, we're not talking about those in this lecture, but your book does discuss them. And Thebes is the area with the very famous Valley of the Kings. Also, we'll be looking at a monument from Hierakonpolis, just a little further south. And the monument we'll conclude with for the day is actually the furthest south city indicated on this map, Abu Simbel. So you can see there's a significant spread of our centers for today. Neolithic culture, Neolithic meaning New Stone Age as opposed to Paleolithic, the Old Stone Age. This began in Egypt around 5500 BCE, that is before the Common Era. Dynastic succession started in 3100 BCE. You might notice that all of the cities on this map are very close to the Nile River, and that is the basis of all Egyptian culture. Ancient Egypt as we know it was really only within a few hundred miles either way from the Nile. The crops of ancient Egypt uh, would thrive from the rich soil of the world's longest river. It travels through lands that very rarely got rainfall. The Nile is a symbol of fertility also because they were able to predict the floods, which offered a calendar-like cycle for agricultural development. And agricultural development is essential for any fixed community to survive. That's why they can stay in one place because they're able to develop ag agriculture. They had a writing system of hieroglyphics, which you've probably seen before. These are pictorial symbols representing syllables. The way they unlocked the language of the hieroglyphs is with the discovery of the Rosetta Stone while Napoleon occupied Egypt. It's named for the city it was found in. It's this large stone now held in the British Museum that has the same message written in three different languages, one being Greek, the other in Demotic, which was a late Egyptian language, and the final language is in hieroglyphics. 
It was once a spoken language and not just pictographs as we see it today. There's a significant pantheon of gods and goddesses. This is a polytheistic culture, a culture that uh, worships many gods. Some of the primary ones include Amun or Re, who is the sun god. Horus was a very important god who is shown as a falcon or a falcon-headed man. He was the son of Osiris and Isis, and when a king was alive, he identified with Horus. After his death, he was largely identified with Osiris, who is the sort of god of death and the afterlife. Hathor is another important goddess that we'll mention today as well. She was considered the divine mother of the pharaoh, and she is shown typically as a woman with cow horns or as a woman with a cow head. The rule of ancient Egypt is split into dynasties and then into kingdom classifications. So we have four major periods of ancient Egypt, the pre-dynastic period, the old kingdom, the middle kingdom, and the new kingdom. And within each of these kingdoms, there are a number of dynasties. The center of rule varied pretty significantly, which is why we'll be looking at a number of sites in ancient Egypt, as often the king would move the capital to wherever he saw fit for whatever reason. So because of this, the monuments are all over the place. As you can see on this map, there are two major regions, especially during the pre-dynastic period. They were political rivals for quite some time. That is Upper Egypt, which is a little bit confusing because it's actually in the south and Lower Egypt, which is in the north. And it's named this way because you may recall that the Nile is a very strange river and it actually runs south to north. So upper refers to upstream of the Nile and lower to downstream of the Nile. So let's go ahead and start looking at some of these images for the day. What you're seeing here is called the Narmer Palette. It was found in the city of Hierakonpolis in this pre-dynastic period, and it dates to about 3100 BCE. This is about two feet high, just to give you a sense of scale here. This is one of the earliest historical art objects that has been preserved. It takes the form of a pallet, hence why it's called the Narmer pallet. And pallets were stone slabs with circular depressions, as you can see on one side of this. So what I'm showing you here are both sides. It's not two separate objects. This image just shows the front and the back. So what this is, is so what this is is a formalized version of this utilitarian object, a pallet. Traditionally, they were used for grinding eye makeup, which is what that circular depression would normally be used for, because men and women often blackened their eyelids in ancient Egypt, which would prevent infection and reduced sun glare. Think of how football players do that. This is a very good example of bilateral symmetry which means that it's the same on both sides of the vertical axis. In the center, we have King Narmer. He's the largest figure on the left side image that I'm showing you here. And he's actually identified a couple of times on this through pictographs, so images that are used for writing hieroglyphics. And you see it directly above the figure. You see it here. And also on the back side, you see it here, right in front of him, just so you know, make sure I know that this figure right here is Narmer. So this pictograph shows a fish this way, which is, stands for Nar, and then a vertical chisel, which stands for Mer, so his name is Narmer. What we have here is the earliest existing labeled work of art. I'm going to go ahead and switch slides here. This is just a, a line drawing of the same image so you can maybe see a little bit better what's been depicted here. What we're seeing is probably a monument that records the unification of Upper and Lower Egypt. Remember I said that in the pre-dynastic period they were politically divergent. So Narmer, uh, one of the earliest kings, managed to unify the two. Historically, this is an activity that took a lot of time, but it is shown in this image artistically as a single event. So he's identified as a king through the hieroglyph showing his name, but also through the scale he is portrayed in. This is called a hieratic scale, where the most important figure is the largest. On the left side, on the front of this, he is shown wearing the white crown of Upper Egypt. You see it right here. It looks a lot like a bowling pin. And on the back side, we see him here with the red crown of Lower Egypt. And so that's one reason we know that it is showing this unification of the two different areas. This is an early example of the formula for the representation of figures in Egyptian art. You're probably familiar with the sort of strange 
way that Egyptians show the figure. So for example, if we look at the image on the left, we see his legs in profile. We see this little indication of his knees and some of the musculature of his legs. And then when we get to the hips, they're turned towards us. The widest part of the body is turned towards the viewer. The same with the shoulders. So we're seeing his shoulders as if we're seeing him from straight on. And then his face is seen mostly in profile, as that is the most characteristic view of the face. You'll see that the eye is shown as if it were flat against his face in this way. So this isn't really a naturalistic depiction, but instead Egyptian artists choose to show figures in this formulaic way. The most characteristic part are shown throughout the body, even if this means changing the vantage point, even in the same single figure. The palette is divided from top to bottom by registers. So on the left side, we have two registers, one here and then one below. On this, on the back side, we have three registers separated by these horizontal bands. And stories are unfolding within each of the register. You might notice also that at the top of each side, we have these two pairs of cow heads. So this is representing Hathor. And remember, she is this protective goddess seen as this mother of the pharaoh. On the left, on the left, side, Narmer has been shown in a position we call the smiting position. So he's raised this mace in the air. He's got this captive down below him. Notice how different his hairstyle is than uh, Narmer. And he's got him by the hair and he's about to smack him, bash his head in with this mace. So it's this very powerful position. Notice he's also barefoot. Narmer is standing on this register band uh, completely barefoot. Behind him is one of his attendants who is holding his shoes. So we know that this is its a symbol of this preordained fate of victory and unification of Egypt. On this same side, we see the god Horus shown as a falcon. We see the god Horus here depicted as a falcon, and he's standing on top of these papyrus reeds attached to the head of a dead enemy, and this is showing that Lower Egypt has been tamed. He's even got this hook up his nose, and these papyrus reeds tended to grow in Lower Egypt near the delta of the Nile River. Also on this left side, we see Narmer literally standing on top of these enemies. Perhaps they're dead, perhaps they're just injured, but either way, he is literally standing on top of them. On the back side of the palette, we have a couple of other things going on here. At the very top register, we see uh, Narmer again wearing the crown of Lower Egypt. Again, he has his attendant carrying his shoes behind him. And then in front of him, you have several other attendants who are carrying various banners. And then if you look on the far right side of this upper register, you see the bodies of 10 enemies. All have been decapitated and all of them have their head between their feet. So they're processing towards these bodies. And you might notice that we're seeing these figures from the side, but seeing these figures from the top. This way you can show more figures. So you have to kind of learn how to read Egyptian images. They're not trying to create a naturalistic space. They're trying to show as much information as possible. In the middle register, we have these two strange feline creatures with very long necks. Their entwined necks form the palette center, which is what makes this the palette, this seemingly functional object. But their intertwined necks probably represent this unification, and the two attendants who are reining them in show the power of the pharaoh to do this. And then in the very bottom register, we have a bull, a very powerful symbol, who is crushing an enemy. And then we see him breaking against the city wall right here that has some kind of fortress and a few other buildings scattered inside it. So the bull probably also symbolizes the king and his dominance. What we're seeing is not a specific historical narrative, but rather an assertion through art of the king's power. He's supreme and isolated from ordinary men, made much larger through hieratic scale, and he is eminently triumphal over his enemy. Narmer is also shown using what is called the canon of proportions, and that's something that we see here. This was an ideal image that the Egyptians developed of the human form, and it's all about the ratios of a human's height with its component parts. All parts of the body are calculated against this certain component, and typically that is the size of the fist. So if you look at any of these grids, you'll see that one square in this grid is the size of the figure's fist. This grid of design meant that every body part has its own place on this grid, and it works for representations of all sizes since it's proportional. So it doesn't matter how large 
your figure is going to be depicted or how small, you can always make sure they fit into this canon, this standard of proportions, making life easier for the artist, but also making things easier for the viewer so that you get a, a very standard depiction of the human figure. Now I want to turn to architecture, specifically looking at funerary architecture. You'll remember I said that we're talking a lot about funeral rites and funerary practices in the religions of ancient Egypt. The earliest funerary monuments are mastabas, which we're seeing at the top right of this diagram. The word mastaba is Arabic for bench, which you can probably understand why because of its shape. These were typically made of brick or stone and probably derived from earthen mounds from even earlier tombs. So earlier tombs would have just been dirt or sand piled on top of a funerary chamber. Originally they housed single burials, but soon they also added uh, burials for the family of whoever was being buried there. The main feature of the tomb besides the burial was the chapel. So if we're looking at the mastaba, we'll start there, you see that there's this shaft leading down to the burial chamber, and then inside the mastaba itself there's this open space which was the chapel. Inside the chapel was what was called the Ka statue, and the Ka in Egyptian means the soul or the spirit, the life force of the body. And in funerary context, they would place a statue that was meant to house this life force of whoever was being buried. Now we're mostly going to be looking at Ka statues of kings, but these existed even for regular people. Inside the chapel, there would be an offering table, which you see here. And then you would have this wall or this false door that would separate the, the visitor to this chapel from the Ka statue itself. It's a way that the, so that the soul could join the world of the living. This is the place where the living could communicate with the dead, could give them offerings, bring them meals, etc. Again, they did not have direct access to the statue because it was so important, the fact that it contained their soul, but they could see it through small holes in the structures. The next phase of funerary architecture is the stepped pyramid, which you see on the lower left, but it's likely developed from stacking the stabas on top of each other. And eventually we get to the more typical pyramid shape that we're used to seeing, those of the pyramids at Giza, where again they're stacking the stabas, but they're smoothing out the edges. They also develop how these are organized in terms of where the burial chambers are. So these temples or tomb complexes evolved into even larger ritual spaces. So here I'm showing you is the stepped pyramid of King Jojer from Saqqara. On the top we're seeing a photograph of the pyramid itself and some of the temple complex. On the bottom, this is what's more important, what I want to show you is down at the bottom, is this entire complex, this enormous space where many rituals were carried out after the king had died. So it seems like there's this great emphasis on death in ancient Egypt. They're interested in life and the afterlife. How are they going to continue life after death? And this is very important, especially for the king, because the king was expected to renew his kingship every year, even after he had died. So for example, in the complex we're seeing below, the serdab that we see here, which is where the Ka statue would have been, held, so one of the most important sites of the complex, and then here we're also seeing the Hebsed court, and this is where every single year the soul of the king, embodied by a proxy, would run a foot race to make sure that the king was still powerful even after death. So when we look at these monuments, they're much, much more than just a stepped pyramid. They also have these major complexes for funerary rites, but also for the rituals after the king had died. These pyramids took massive labor forces to create, and also they had a significant program for sculpture and art left within the tomb that it must have been immense. The wealth of these leavings often included gold and precious materials so that the king would have everything he could possibly need in the afterlife, both for regular living, but also for accessing the afterlife. There was quite a ritual that one had to undergo in order to pass into the kingdom of the dead, and your reading deals with this aspect. It's really quite fascinating. This is another reason that the Egyptians mummified their bodies. They wanted to preserve them for as long as possible. The more intact the body, the more likely it was to live forever in the afterlife. So let's turn now to so let's turn now to these monuments, which I'm sure you are all familiar with. So one of the 
ancient great wonders of the world. We have the Great Pyramids from Giza, Egypt. These are from the Old Kingdom. These date between 2551 and 2472 BCE. These are built in sequence, not all built at once. The kings amassed a great deal of wealth during their lifetimes, and they spent a great deal of this on major monumental building projects. These three pyramids are built over the course of about 75 years as the tombs of Khufu, Khafra, and Menkare. These are a father, his son, and then his grandson as well. Another reason it's thought that the Egyptians liked the pyramidal form was because of a, a stone that was used in rituals dedicated to the sun god Ra, which was called the Benben. So these are actually symbols of the sun. The pyramids are where the kings were reborn in the afterlife. They have four sides, just like the stepped pyramid that I just showed you, and they are oriented perfectly with the four cardinal points of the compass. The funerary temples sit on the east side of the complex here so that they face the rising sun. They're on the west side of the Nile, which is where the sun sets, the great symbol of the end of life. I wanted to show you this image, how much texture there is in these monuments. They would have originally been a little bit more smooth than they are today. Time has taken its toll. Tourists have taken their toll. Here I'm showing you a cutaway drawing of what the interior of the pyramid would have looked like. The number one here in, in this is indicating the silhouette that would have originally had that facing stone. So I'm going to go back for just a second. Here we're seeing the skeleton, the under part of the construction. And originally they would have had a whole sheath of marble coating the top of it. So instead of having the funeral, the, the tomb chamber underground as we saw with the Mastaba construction, with the Great Pyramids at Giza, they had that as a false chamber to try to trick thieves. Instead, the tomb chamber was in the very center. There was a large entrance gallery. At number eight, you're seeing these relieving blocks, which were put in to help support the weight of all that stone on top of the king's chamber. That way it wouldn't collapse. Here I'm showing you this model of the entire complex of the three pyramids. Uh, the one indicated as number seven is actually the largest of the three pyramids, and this model shows that nicely. In most images of the pyramids, it looks like the center one is the largest, but in fact, it's set up on a higher plane, and so it looks bigger. So number seven here is the earliest one of Khufu. Number two is the son of Khufu, Khafra. And number one, the smallest, is Khafra's son, Menkare's pyramid. But here you're seeing that these are much, much larger complexes than just a pyramid. The mortuary temple will be placed outside of the pyramid, on the east side of each, facing the rising sun. And this is, again, where offerings could be made and ceremonies performed. Each complex also had a causeway, which are these long lines, leading to the floodplain on the edge of the Nile River, and there would be a valley temple situated there as well as part of these afterlife rituals. So it also, these complexes, like with the Stepped Pyramid of Djoser, acted not just as a tomb, but essentially a palace for the afterlife. So what would happen when these kings had died, after they were mummified, the body was ceremoniously ferried across the Nile from the royal palaces, and then ritual games would take place to prepare his soul for the journey to the kingdom of the dead. These all culminated with the placement of the body in the pyramid's burial chamber, and they were then sealed off. So to build these, there was a huge workforce necessary. It required this mastery of stonemasonry and the organization of this massive workforce, almost certainly of slaves. It began with quarrying the stone, and this is almost exclusively limestone, they probably cut it with copper or stone chisels and wooden mallets, and each stone was of uniform size. They were then transported to the building site, probably on a system of wooden rollers and sleds. These were not built by aliens. Some of the smaller stones could be carried. The stones also had to be dressed, that is to be made perfectly smooth and uniform for a perfect fit, and then they would rub the surface with fine polishing stones. They almost certainly made huge rubble ramps against the core of the pyramid, and then they modified them as they built upwards. We're not sure exactly what shape these ramps were. Perhaps they were a spiral around the core of the pyramid or a zigzag, or maybe it was a simple linear ramp. Ropes, pulleys, and levers were used to lift and lower the stones in place. And then the entire thing would be encased in white limestone, which would have been very reflective and shiny. Remember, think of these as symbols of the sun. The joints would have barely been detected. And a few of these casing stones can still be seen on the top of Khafra's pyramid in the center, this uh, cap right here. So as I mentioned, Khufu's, the back pyramid in this photograph, is the oldest and the largest, and it's almost a completely solid mass of masonry. 
The base of one side is 775 feet long and it covers an area of 13 acres. Now it's about 450 feet high, but it originally was about 480 feet. It contains 2.3 million blocks of stone, each one weighing an average of 2.5 tons, and some of the larger ones at the base weigh up to 15 tons. So these are just incredibly massive monuments. I also like this photo because it gives you a sense of just how close these are to modern day Cairo. These aren't off in the desert like you often seem to think from photographs we see of them, but instead the modern Egypt has been built up essentially right against them. So let's move from architecture to sculpture for just a moment. What I'm showing you here is a statue of Menkare, the one who had the smallest pyramid, and a queen who is almost certainly his wife, Kamara Nebti. This was found in the chapel associated with his pyramid, and it dates from somewhere between 2490 and 2470 BCE. And again, we're in the fourth kingdom here. As I mentioned before, most of these Ka statues were made of stone, although the lower classes would use wood and clay. And this is a very particular type of slate called gray wacky. This is very characteristic of old kingdom sculpture, rigid, stoic expressions, the standing figures from this period have one foot forward, one foot stepping forward. They're very calm and dignified portraits, and there's a definite sense of permanence in the materials. Now, one thing very characteristic of ancient Egypt is that stylistically, these sculptures don't change a great deal over time, and that adds to our idea of this permanence of the king, that even over a thousand years of history of the kingdoms of Egypt, their sculpture stays very consistent among them. So there's this permanence. They're very, they, they develop a system and they really stick with it. The two figures are wedded together in this stone block. It could almost be called high relief sculpture. You can see the stone uh, that hasn't been carved away between them, between their legs, even between the arm of the king and the rest of his body. It's a very typical pose with the hands clenched into fists. The thumbs are forward, the arms are kept close to the body. Notice also that it lacks a bit of naturalism. And what I mean by that is, yes, the faces are very distinctive. They're, they're idealized portraits of these two figures. But look at the legs. So I mentioned that they're both sort of stepping forward. But when a person steps forward, their hips shift position. And you may notice that the hips of the king are perfectly even. So that would mean that if he were, if he were to come to life, for example, one of his legs would be longer than the other. The wife is shown in a similar position and she embraces the king and this gesture indicates that they were married. They show, show no affection or emotion. They look out into space. They're not portraying living figures though. They're su supposed to suggest a timelessness as this is the eternal home of the Ka, of the life force. It can be considered a portrait, an ideal it can be considered a portrait, an idealized portrait, but it doesn't really it's not really meant here both figures are wearing very typical garb. He is wearing the typical kilt and headdress seen that we often see with Egyptian kings, and he's also wearing a false beard that kings often wear. It symbolizes divinity. And she is wearing a wig. You can kind of see, if you look closely here, she has a, a separate hairline underneath where this wig covers her body. Notice how tight her dress is, this emphasis on the body below. You can see her kneecaps, her groin area, her belly, and her breasts indicated very, very clearly. Originally, this would have been painted, although the sand of ancient Egypt has removed most of that. So what we're seeing here is an Egyptian ideal of this athletic, youthful figure, this permanent youth so that the king could maintain that in the afterlife. Now I'm going to jump. A, now I'm going to jump a great deal into the future. Remember, uh, Menkare, who we just looked at, is from somewhere around 2490 BCE, and now we're going to jump to about 1350 BCE, so almost a thousand years forward, and we're moving to the 18th dynasty. This figure that I'm showing you here is called Akhenaten. And he was the chief perpetrator of the most unusual and short-lived period in Egyptian history. He had a 17-year reign. His most famous relative was his son, and I use that term loosely, who we call King Tut, who essentially changed everything back to normal after Akhenaten died. Although this isn't a provable relation. Some people say that King Tut was his actual son. He may have been a relative that he adopted as his heir. We don't really know. So what exactly did Akhenaten do? that was so dramatic that I'm talking about. 
Well, he changed the religious program from one of polytheism to one of monotheism, to the worship of a single god. And this god was the life-giving sun deity Aten. He changed his name, Akhenaten, which means one is effective on behalf of Aten. So he's this embodiment of this sun god. He moved the capital from the well-established area of Thebes in Upper Egypt, the city that he named Akhetaten, which we now call Amarna. The modern city is called Tel El Amarna. And so often the reign of Akhenaten is referred to as the Amarna period. In Akhetaten, he made these open courtyarded temples so that they were bathed in the sun's light all the time. Akhenaten was also shown in this very strange style compared to the images of kings that came before and those that came after. It's maybe a bit more realistic, but it also seems to be modified in some interesting ways. He's always shown with these very long, thin arms and legs, this slightly protruding stomach, swelling thighs and hips, a skinny neck, and an elongated skull. Here we're seeing Akhenaten shown in a very typical way with the false beard of kingship. He's wearing the blue war crown here. And he has a crook and a flail with his arms crossed, which is a symbol of Osiris. After Akhenaten died, there was a very quick return to tradition. So here I wanted to show you this image, which is a portrait relief of Akhenaten and his family, found at Amarna. It dates to somewhere between 1349 and 1336 BCE, and this is made of limestone and would have originally been painted. This is a sunken relief, so hopefully you can get a sense from this reproduction that these are shadows you're seeing, that the highest point is the surface of the block, and the figures and the hieroglyphs have been carved into it. Often we see the opposite, where the background, the negative space, has been carved away, and that's typically called low or high relief, depending on the depth of the carving. At the center of this image of the king and his family is the Aten. It is this sun disk that has these life-giving rays extending from it. And if you look closely, you'll notice that each ray has a little hand on it. Some of these are holding these little symbols called Ankhs, and they are symbols of the life force. And notice that they're holding these up to the mouths of the king and queen and even to one of their daughters right in the very center here. So they both, the king and the queen, sit on these cushioned thrones holding three of their daughters. Akhenaten is on the left and his wife Nefertiti is shown on the right side. Notice how similarly their bodies are represented. Akhenaten is shown in this almost feminine way and scholars have tried to explain this through a number of different ways saying that Maybe he actually looked like this. Maybe he had some kind of bone disease that made him look like this. But what's more likely is he was, he was changing the religion, so he probably changed the artistic style as well. We can't really call this naturalistic because it's almost certain that Akhenaten, did have this, that Akhenaten had this very long neck, this very elongated head, or that his poor little daughters had these long, skinny, alien-like heads. There's a certain sweetness to this, though, as the king and the queen interact with their children. He brings one of his daughters to kiss her on the mouth, and Nefertiti is shown with one on her shoulder and one on her lap. And certainly, this is not what babies this size look like. So you have to understand that these are uh, a type of representation. They're not meant to look like reality, and that's not their goal. It's not that they couldn't do it. It's just that that is their artistic style at the time. I also wanted to show you this very famous bust of Nefertiti. It's actually miraculous that any of these images of Akhenaten or his family have survived because after he died, they issued a, a, an order to destroy all of his images to essentially erase his memory. So what's been found is actually quite unique. A lot managed to survive. For, a lot managed to survive, fortunately. And so this bust, which contains almost all of its original paint, was found at Amarna in the workshop of a sculptor named Tutmosa. It's a deliberately unfinished model, so I wanted to show it to you from the front. Often you just see it in profile because you'll notice that her left eye has not been painted in or has not been inlaid as it may have been. So it's the sort of before and after demonstration piece. It's one single portrait of the queen that the sculptor Tutmosa creates so that it can be followed by him or perhaps other sculptors in his workshop. There's no need to create both eyes. You really only need one because it's going to be the same on both sides. 
this has these incredibly curving contours. It's this very beautiful piece. I saw it recently in the museum in Berlin, and it's just stunning in person. She may be a reference to a very heavy flower on a slender stalk, as she has this very heavy head on a slender neck and a lot of flowers that grew along the Nile of the river. She was a very influential ruler, the wife of Akhenaten. She actually seems to have quite a bit of power, even though her husband was the ruler. But it's this very interesting and lifelike depiction of a queen, and it's something that we don't get a lot of from ancient Egypt since so much paint has been erased since so often the sculpture is these permanent idealized portraits. And certainly this is probably idealized to a certain extent, but you can get a real sense of the tendons and veins in her neck and the contours of her face. And it's, it's incredibly lifelike, especially for this period. So now I want to jump forward to probably the most famous king from ancient Egypt, um, that of King Tut or Tutankhamun. Here I'm showing you the funerary mask of this very young king found in the Valley of the Kings. Uh, it dates also from the 18th dynasty. Remember, he is the successor to Akhenaten. And this is from about 1327 BCE. It's made out of hammered gold and semi-precious stones. All of that blue that you see in the headdress is lapis lazuli, which only comes from one place in the world uh, in modern day Afghanistan. He was this really actually rather a minor figure in Egyptian history, but he's so famous because his tomb, which was discovered by Howard Carter in 1922, was fabulously rich. It had actually been pillaged, but not that badly. The thieves who had come in didn't manage to get to every room. Here is a, an artistic here is a, an artistic rendering of what he may have looked like. Not only does his do his funerary goods survive, but his skeleton does as well. And people are so fascinated with him that based on the funerary mask, but also the skeleton. This is probably what he looked like. He died quite young, and there's been lots of conspiracy theories about exactly how he died. Perhaps he was murdered. Perhaps he had an infection in his leg. It's really not very clear. Here I'm just giving you a sense of where it was discovered. So here we are at the city of Thebes. Uh, the temples of Karnak and Luxor are very nearby here across the Nile River. And then set into these hills is called the Valley of the Kings, where many, many burials have been discovered. Here's an image taken at the time of discovery uh, in 1922. Kings were buried with a great deal of things they might use in their everyday life. Because remember, the afterlife is this continuation of the king's life. He would need furniture. He would need chariots. He would need food. He would need everything in order to both live, but also to go through these rituals that took place after his death in order to renew his kingship. Here I'm showing you a cutaway. Here I'm showing you a cutaway drawing of the chambers that were found intact. And I like this because you can see just how uh, precious the objects were that were found inside. Tons and tons of golden objects, chariot, everything was made of the most precious materials possible, things that would last throughout eternity. The coffins and the things around his body were the most spectacular. And if you look here in this large section, you can see these, it's a cutaway view looking into all of the different layers of coffins, sarcophagi that surrounded his body. So there were many, many containers that the body was placed into. The innermost coffin shows King Tut as Osiris, and here it is showing King Tut as Osiris. So we see him with his arms crossed, holding the crook, the crook and the flail, which is how Osiris is almost always shown. But he's not shown just as Osiris, he's a king as Osiris, because he still has the false beard of kingship, he's wearing the headdress, and he's also wearing uh, the viper and falcon that we saw in the funerary mask. We'll see that again in just a minute, which are often shown as symbols of kingship rather than as symbols of Osiris. But this coffin was the most luxurious of the three, and it's made around made of around 500 pounds of beaten gold, and again inlaid with these semi-precious stones. This is what it looked like once they opened that innermost coffin. This is that shining golden mask I showed you a minute ago, and we'll show you again. You can see just how well it survives. And even in this black and white photo, you get a sense of how shiny it was. There was a wreath of dried flowers placed around his neck. The great thing about gold is that it will last forever, and it doesn't tarnish. So it never loses its luster. And remember, their emphasis on the sun as well, so this reflective quality was very, very important. 
So this funerary mask is this very nice sensitive portrayal of the king. He looks quite a bit like an adolescent, even if he's dressed in this official regalia, and again with the headdress and false beard, and there you see the viper and the falcon head attached to his forehead. It's this great expression of grandeur and richness in this tomb, especially in the coffins and funerary mask, showing power, pride, and influence all of it only to be encased inside three coffins and sealed into a tomb. So even though he wasn't a warrior king and he was very young, they still showed him as a conqueror. So that goes uh, with many of the other things found in his tomb, that idea of Tut as a conqueror, because he still needs to be seen as this powerful figure. He must renew this kingship after his death. Uh, so this fabulous tomb, um, we know quite a bit about it. There's lots of other information online that you can find. So if you're interested, why don't you have a look out for that? So now, for our last, so now, for our last major monument of this lecture, I want to move to the next dynasty, the 19th dynasty. We're now going to the years about 1279 to 1213 BCE. And what I'm showing you here is a major temple of Ramses II at Abu Simbel in Egypt. Remember, this is the southernmost location I mentioned. This, in, this enormous rock-cut temple, essentially carved out of the side of this huge mountain, was built by Ramses II on the Nile River, far south in the kingdom called Nubia. Actually, what we're seeing is not in its original location. This is actually a really interesting thing. It was moved in 1968, 700 feet from its original location, so that it would not be submerged after they built what's called the Aswan High Dam on the Nile River. So these modern changes often threaten monuments. This is happening all the time, even today. And here, UNESCO funded the moving of this monument so that it wouldn't be lost forever. The reign of Ramses II was very long. It lasted for two-thirds of a century and was very fruitful. He controlled many areas, evidenced by his temples here at this very southern site at Abu Simbel, which is actually where he ruled from. But also, he contributed to the complexes at Luxor and Karnak. Again, those are in your textbook. He added to those and remodeled them. Ramses was the last great warrior pharaoh. He was a great military commander and a political strategist. He secured peace with the Hittites, which was this rival Anatolian power, and he had a huge building program. Outside, we see four enormous, colossal seated statues. Colossal means well over life size. Each of these are 65 feet tall and all showing the same figure, Ramses and he dominates the facade. So try to imagine just how huge they would be if they stood up, if these are 65 feet tall, and there's a couple of people, tourists, visiting the site so you can get a sense of scale here. It's carved directly out of this cliffside. So a colossal statue is a proclamation of greatness, and this whole temple is symbolizing how he restored the empire during his reign. Colossal statues, and these in particular, do lack the refinement of some earlier sculptures, so things are a bit stylized, there's not as much detail, because there's a lot that has to be sacrificed for scale, but this is characteristic of all colossal sculpture in every period and every place, so it's not particular to ancient Egypt. But there's not just Ramses on the facade, he actually placed little statues of family members alongside his legs, so you might notice these little figures here, and here, there's a couple of queens, a couple of children. They don't even come up to his knees. They're so tiny. They're important, but they're not nearly as important as the king. Here I'm showing you a view into the interior chamber. It was also colossal, and these were lined with portrait statues of Ramses that were 32 feet high. There's a man over here to the lower left to try to give you a sense of scale. Here he's been carved as the god Osiris. And here he looks even a bit more like, like Osiris than what we saw in King Tut's sarcophagus. He get, again has his arms crossed. He would be holding the crook and the flail. It's hard to see in any of these images. He's got the false beard of kingship, but he's wearing this very typical headgear that Osiris wears, and his body is very compact. It almost looks like it's mummified in this context, so that's very much like Osiris. They're carved as one with the pillars from the cliff, but they actually have no load-bearing function, so they don't actually support the weight of the cliff above them. Along the back wall, which you can see just a little bit, you also have four statues also depicting Ramses. You shouldn't be surprised by that at this point. And this temple was oriented so that on the most important day of the Egyptian calendar, the entire inside was illuminated by the rising sun. So this emphasis on the sun, there's this strong interest in how to 
situate things for important days of the year to the cardinal directions. The Egyptians were very aware of the world around them. So just to conclude, because I'm not going to go beyond the 19th dynasty, unfortunately, we just don't have time. Eventually, Egypt is conquered by the Greeks and then the Romans, and eventually Egypt becomes part of the Ottoman world. Some of the major things I've talked about today is this emphasis on consistency in art, this timelessness in art for thousands of years. And remember that almost all of the art we've looked at is centered around funerary practices and religion. There's this emphasis on the gods, this emphasis on the afterlife, and this emphasis on kingship, both during their life, but especially after their death. The afterlife is much longer than life itself, so they wanted to make sure they were prepared for that. So now what you need to do to finish module two is to take the self-assessment quiz. Also, there's a discussion board where you visit the PBS Pyramid site. You can go inside the pyramids, and I want you to write a bit about that experience. Also, you have a, an assignment on the voice board where you choose an object from the Metropolitan Museum of Arts collection and describe it, perhaps using the vocabulary you learned today. And also to review the vocabulary that I've listed in the vocab wiki. Remember, I'm taking care of that this first week, but you'll be responsible for it in the future. Thank you very much for watching this today. Uh, good luck finishing up Module 2, and I will see you next time for Module 3 for Ancient Greece.